the real history of Perfect Blue and Requiem for a Dream. So are you guys familiar with the connection of Re Requiem for a Dream and Perfect Blue? I'm not, actually. No. So, I, Darren... I have not seen Requiem for a Dream, but I do have the, what was it, Lux Eterna, the one uh, song from the soundtrack okay. that was in uh, Sunshine. That's the okay. only thing that I have from it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Darren Aronofsky... Uh, this is this was the 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 word on the street before this article got produced. Um, basically, it said Darren Aronofsky bought the rights to Satoshi Kon's Perfect Blue so that he could just use shots from it in his movies because Satoshi Kon is so brilliant, right? Um, so that's it what seems they like, say. That's what they say. It seems like this might not be the case. So. Welcome to another issue of the Animation Obsessive Newsletter. Here's what we're doing today. One, Satoshi Kon versus Darren Aronofsky in detail. Two, this week's in animation news around the world. Blah, blah, blah. Let's start with his. Number one, too much homage. At this point, the similarities between Darren Aronofsky's Re Requiem for a Dream and Satoshi Kon's cult classic Perfect Blue are common knowledge. You've likely seen a few, ex a few of the side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, yeah, we can definitely show that. Anyway, <laughs> more of that stuff. Um, they've circulated for years. Each time they reappear, there's another small uproar and old rumors pop up again, like the one where Aronofsky supposedly owned the rights to adapt Perfect Blue. He didn't. That said, we're not here to restate the obvious. Perfect Blue and Requiem for a Dream are similar, but we're interested in the follow-up questions. Why? What really happened between Cohn and Aronofsky? And why? Uh, and when does homage stop being respectful and start being exploitative? We've chased down the answers for months, dredging up every source we can find, and even importing the recent French documentary Satoshi Cohn, The Illusionist. A tweet thread by Richmond Lee of Art Eater was also a big help. Today, we're using what we've learned to set the record straight. So let's take a trip into the past to the turn of the 21st century. <clears throat> in Requiem for a Dream, I was probably in the script process. I think I was looking for a scene to kind of get internal the internal mindset of Jennifer Connelly's character, Marion. And probably at the same time, I saw Perfect Blue. So this is Aronofsky in the Illusionist uh, documentary talking about the bathtub scene. Once upon a time, Satoshi Kon was a no-name. Just another artist struggling in manga during the 80s. Yet the talent was there and it carried him. Becoming Katsuhiro Otomo's assistant in the manga series Akira, Kone was able to follow Otomo into the anime industry. Kone hopped around as an artist and writer, working on projects like Rojin Z and Magnetic Rose. He climbed the ranks until he got to direct his first feature. That was Perfect Blue. A film that, despite glowing reviews, did little to elevate Kone in the business. And here's how his colleague Masao Muriyama put it: "Quote, let's say that so, uh, let's say some said it was an original film, that it was very striking, and that it left a strong impression. We can't say that the animation industry considered a very good film. We did not, we did not cover our costs. Basically, Perfect Blue flopped. Cohn was, as the as the later described himself, an unsuccessful animation director." But his film struck a chord with another artist, an ocean away. What's up? What's do we have a comment I should cover? Boy, I love talking to nobody. Basically, perfect blue flopped. Okay. <laughs> Darren Aronofsky was an anime fan and a budding director. He just debuted his first movie, Pi, in 1998, Maybe which had a much lower budget than Perfect Blue, but made much more money. So Aronofsky was working on his next film. This was Requiem for a Dream, based on a book from the 1970s by Hubert Selby Jr. Aronofsky found Perfect Blue while writing the script. I was blown away by it. It was fantastic, he, remember, uh, he remembered in The Illusionist. And it was very different than any other anime that was out there that I had seen. At that time, many live-action directors in America were taking from anime. It was often treated as raw material. When Terminator 2 borrowed a moment from Akira, one of James Cameron's artists recalled that Otomo's original visual was, quote, almost like a storyboard for the team. The Wachowskis pitched The Matrix by playing their producer, Ghost in the Shell. 
as she, as he recounted, quote, they said, we want to do that for real. And, you know, that was an incredible idea to actually see that animation come to life. And believe me, essentially it has. Aronofsky was so smitten with Perfect Blue that at one point he even tried to buy the rights to, a, to do a live action remake. That deal never went through, though. Aronofsky has given various reasons why over the years. Either way, the film influenced him. Most of the events in Requiem for a Dream derive from Shelby's book, a disorienting stream of consciousness story about addiction and despair. But Aronofsky also incorporated ideas from Perfect Blue, most famously the scene where Jennifer Connelly's character screams underwater in a bathtub. He remembers reaching out to Cohn for permission, although we haven't seen Cohn mention this. Cohn, for his part, was shocked when he saw Requiem for a Dream in the early 2000s. He told the readers of his blog, quote, there are scenes in Requiem that are heavily influenced by Perfect, uh, by Perfect and shots that were copied in their entirety. He singled out the tub scene, but didn't stop there. The shared motif of the red dress drew his attention too. Then, on January 18, 2021, the two directors met. And they had an orgy. <laughs> It was a conversation at a hotel hosted by Esquire to promote Requiem for a Dream. They spoke through an interpreter. Cohn attempted partly to, ad to advertise his second film, Millennium Actress. He and Aronofsky followed it with food at a Thai restaurant. Aronofsky was overjoyed. Quote, I will never forget the meal I had with Satoshi Cohn in Tokyo. He was incredibly generous and warm. For a fan, it was a huge thrill. He, it was a huge thrill, he later wrote. He said that he uh, he said that he asked Cohn, quote, what he thought of the tub shot, and he said he was very proud. So it was great. It was a lot of fun to have that kind of connection with him. Yeah, I'm sure that's what he said. <laughs> Cohn's it's like the interpreter's just softballing all of his angry statements. Uh, Cohn's view of the conversation was a bit different, I bet. When I was told kind of upon bit, meeting him oh, that he was a fan, he wrote on his blog, all I could do was respond with the vague smile that Japanese people are good at. Regarding the shot, Cohn, uh, Cohn broached the subject by telling Aronofsky, I was a little embarrassed to see scenes in Requiem that I had seen somewhere before. Aronofsky replied that he was paying homage. As Cohn's former colleagues reportedly say in The Illusionist, Cohn had two sides. One side was endearing. Cohn could be supportive and courteous. Aronofsky saw that part of him. Yet at other times, Cohn could be vicious. He burned bridges. Many of his closest co-workers, even, uh, even those who remember him fondly, have described him with the, fr with the phrase Iyana Yatsu, nasty guy. <laughs> he never Cone, took a shower. <laughs> Cohn revealed a bit of his side, uh, a bit of this side on his blog after the meal, ribbing Aronofsky and suggesting that Requiem had ripped off Perfect Blue. He wrote that Aronofsky was paying too much homage, but his claws weren't totally out and he treated Requiem for a Dream as mostly benign. Cohn was much angrier when he recalled the meeting in 2007 during a lecture, where he said, when I asked him about it, he said it was an homage, laughs, an homage to me, to me! And who's doing this scene in Requiem for a Dream? Jennifer Connelly. She's doing the scene. Just like in my storyboard, laughs. As a side note, last year, I was on the same flight as Jennifer Connelly. She was in first class with her entire family. I was in business class. She gets <laughs> off the plane first. <laughs> oh, shit. R Runa guy said, so you didn't get a chance to talk to her? No, you can't go, hey, Jennifer, damn you, you copycatted me. <laughs> well, <laughs> not like it was, uh, she was the one who did it. In part, his feelings were understandable. Aronofsky was a star by this point, while Cohn was scrambling for funding. Pi was a hit and Perfect Blue wasn't. That pattern <laughs> played out again with Requiem for a Dream and Millennium Actress. Although Requiem for a Dream isn't too Perfect Blue, it, I'm sorry, although Requiem for a Dream isn't to Perfect Blue what The Matrix is to Ghost in the Shell, you can still feel Cone's influence in it. Honestly, I don't feel like uh, The Matrix is that close to Ghost in the Shell other than plugging in, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Other than all the butt plugging. Yes, and, the butt the plugging. Inter and the interface being green. Uh, yeah. Oh God, was it green lined? You feel it especially in the Connolly character, whose arc later in the movie takes cues from Mima, the protagonist of Perfect Blue. It's in the tub scene. It's in the scene where Connolly trashes a room. And what happens to Connolly's character in the final moments of Requiem for a Dream is a close paraphrase of arguably the central sequence in Perfect Blue, from the blinding lights to the cheering man around the table. Uh, cheering men around the table. Unlike most of Requiem for a Dream, for the record. 
This scene is noticeably absent from Selby's original book. Hmm. At least for the last leg of Requiem for a Dream, it's clear that Aronofsky saw in Perfect Blue a source of inspiration for what to do with Connolly's character. Ultimately, it's a small slice of life film, but it's still a slice. So here's a embedded tweet of Satoshi Kon talking about Requiem for a Dream. How Requiem took from Perfect Blue. They came from a Perfect Blue lecture series he did in 2007. So that's probably the as, thing we were talking about earlier. As he's watching the movie, he's just playing that TikTok sound in his head. Oh, can I have a slice of pie? Sure, here's a slice of pie. That's enough slices. <laughs> <laughs> Pointing out that Aronofsky took from Perfect Blue is different from condemning him for it, although you can do both. After all, every piece of art takes from somewhere. Cohn was open about how much he learned from foreign filmmakers like Terry Gilliam. Meanwhile, Perfect Blue's film within a film double blind plays uh, double blind plays much the same same role in its story as Invitation to Love does in Twin Peaks, a series that went big in Japan. At the same time, though, there's an ethical question. Until the end of his life, Cohn was a struggling director. Even after two acclaimed films, he was so unsuccessful that Tokyo Godfathers almost didn't get finished. It is still an homage when it is still an homage when you're lifting from an immediate contemporary who's far below you in status and clout. I'm sorry, he says, is it? Is it still an homage? As Cohn wrote in 2001 after meeting Aronofsky. By the way, did you know, speaking of the next watch club, that um, Berserk, uh, the trailer for Berserk was edited by Satoshi Kone. The trailer that heard I'm probably that not going to see. Oh, no, yeah, it's a music video. I'm sorry, not the trailer. Oh, the mu there's okay. a music video. Um, and Mr. Nice Guy pointed out on Twitter that there's a ghost frame or whatever, where when he was cutting it, he left accidentally a frame from the previous shot. So for one frame, you can see something that doesn't belong because it was sloppily edited. Uh, okay, anyway. so that's what it was. Well, that's not really uh, selling us more. I'd, I'd heard, I'd heard something, something about something like that, but it was like now that you've said it, I feel underwhelmed. I'm feeling pathetic. It's a pitiful tale when the person being paid homage has less uh, has. Being paid homage to has less name recognition, less social credibility, and less budget to, to spend. So this and is less uh, social credit <laughs> score, right? Almost uh, again, um, again, most of *Requiem for a Dream* comes from Sel Selby's book. Even the mo excuse me, even the motif of the red dress and the moment when people pop out of a TV, which Cohn perceives as plagiarism, mm. are Selby's ideas from the '70s. Requiem for a Dream isn't perfect blue, but it does treat its ideas as fair game. Aronofsky seems to have been a fan first, uh, first and foremost. He loved anime and he loved Cone's work. The culture of swiping from anime in American cinema predated him. It persists now, as Rodney Rotham into the Spider-Verse says in The Illusionist, a lot of people in live action are chasing the Satoshi Cone feel, that level of immersiveness. That included Aronofsky himself later in life when the when he took from Perfect Blue again to make Black Swan. He denied it, but come on. Uh, in the end, the real question we need to ask is much bigger than Aronofsky. It's even bigger than Cone. The question is, is it right for Western directors to use anime as an idea factory without paying its overworked creators a dime? Cone bled for his films. He storyboarded every moment in detail obsessively and still never saw success in his lifetime. He died in 2010, around a week before the premiere of Black Swan. It stung him to see his concept treated as rough drafts for other people's films. He battled to create those concepts until the end. Looking back at their meeting, uh, looking back on their meetings for his interviews in The Illusionist, Aaron Oski remembered, quote, it was kind of inspiring to find out that he was uh, that he was conceiving it, drawing it, writing it. So many of all the different roles were basically coming out of his imagination and the hard work. I remember kind of feeling empathy for how much work he had to do, that it was going to be a lot of pain, a lot of work to get this film done. It, it's kind of weird to me because uh, the only times I've ever heard of Satoshi Kon was like people jacking him off saying, oh, my God, he makes such great films. So, I mean, at what point did he get the success I know of? And, uh, like, oh, yeah. if he wasn't very successful, I mean, in, in from what I've watched, 
it kind of aligns because like I don't know, I'm not I don't find them that fantastic or anything. Are you asking when did he get good? <laughs> I, well, I could tell no, you when he got no good more like when did paranoia. people perceive <laughs> him as good? <laughs> well, I when think pre- I think he's more widely accepted in the West. He has sort of a Western appeal, um, and I think he was largely influenced by the West, but then twisted everything in a almost Junji Ito surrealist kind of way, right? Um, I've enjoyed everything that he's done, but I'm not dying to go watch it again. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never sat through uh, Black Swan or Requiem for a Dream, though, so I'll just throw that out there. 